Uh, my name is Angie Webchick Byron, and I am here to tell you all about newfangledy front end stuff uh, that has happened since grunge was a thing. So, if you are someone who, like me, got into web development back in like the mid 90s and then got out of front end development because you didn't really want to deal with Netscape Navigator versus IE and all those kinds of things, um, and you got into PHP or you know sysadmin stuff. And now you're like hearing a lot of troubling words from your friends, like this, these weird names that don't make any sense. You like SAS and stuff like that and want to know what that's about. That's what this talk is for. Um, a little bit about me. My name, or I'm sorry, I said my name already. Um, I'm a core committer for Drupal Core. So I work with Dries um, in the office of the CTO at Acquia. And uh, my job is to basically make the community go and make awesome things happen. Um, and I originally got started in Drupal as a Google Summer of Code student back in 2005, and my nine-year anniversary with the community was actually yesterday. So that was when I created it. Yeah! So I'm old and decrepit, and speaking of being old, uh, so yes, I was a web developer in 94. Um, I got out of web development and got into back-end development in 99. So this makes me completely unqualified to give this talk, but qualified to tell you to get off my lawn. Um, so why I'm giving this talk, as I mentioned, I got a little bit nervous, kind of got that sinking feeling, like my skills were falling out of date and there's all this new stuff that I didn't know about. Um, and then there was one weekend where I decided to do something with Drupal 8's new REST API and I was like, you know, I'll just give my hand at making a mobile app because I wonder what that's like, you know. And I found some technologies that we'll talk about later, but basically what I found out is like, oh, this is not that hard. Like it sounds really scary, but you can actually do a lot of the same things we used to do back in the 90s and they've just evolved a little bit since then. So I was like, other people really need to know this because it's terrifying from the outside and it's actually not that bad. So what I'm gonna be doing is comparing web development then versus now and defining all these newfangledy terms as we go that you may hear and we'll talk about it. So. Travel with me, everyone, to a time in the distant past, the mid-90s. Not the 1890s, but the 1990s, which by web technology might as well be the 1890s. So this is what pop culture looked like. You had Nirvana and Spice Girls duking it out over the uh, top 10 list. Everyone played with Pogs, right? The, uh, the most popular movies were like Pulp Fiction and Forrest Gump, and Clinton hadn't been impeached yet. It was like a glorious time, really. It was fun. And then technology-wise, it looked like this. Like Google was essentially this thing called Gopher protocol. So you'd like search with like a text thing. It was fun. Mosaic was like the only thing that qualified as a browser and everything was like gray background, blue links and that kind of stuff. Um, what we called BBSs are essentially like Facebook kind of. You know, it's like where you'd like get on there and you'd share files with your friends and you'd talk and stuff. And, um, we, we, we all used what was called the information superhighway. Thanks, Al Gore. Um, and then we also used this horrible thing called IRC that we used to talk to each other. Thank God we don't have to use that thing anymore because it was just terrible. Um, and then I looked like this back in the mid-90s. So that's another reason I'm glad that the 90s are over. So what I'm going to do is kind of take you through, I think, nine or ten different aspects of web development and then talk about then versus now and those kinds of things. So... When we talk about web design back then, basically every single website looked like this. Yeah. Woo. How many people's websites actually look like this when they, yep, that was definitely mine. It just keeps going and going. Okay, I'll save you from that. Okay, but then one day, wow, and this was like before, like this was back, like I was using Photoshop before there were layers, dude. It was like intense. Yeah, boof. Yeah, so like, I think it was Photoshop 3 or whatever, but at some point they introduced the slice tool. This thing was amazing, right? Because you design your really epically, awesomely designed website, right? And then you cut it up into little squares, and all you did is you file, save as HTML, and then you'd spend like the next 50 hours like fixing that HTML. But you know, it was like, it was epic, right? Like you could actually make designs that look pretty cool. Nowadays, what we do is we design in the browser again. Right? Like, that's what we used to do, and we do it again. Uh, Photoshop is passe. You don't really do that anymore. Um, but in order to make the designs of the browser, again, look a lot better than they did back in our day, um, they use a couple of different techniques. So one that I came across was called style tiles, 
what this effectively is doing is almost like making like fabric swatches for your website. So you say like, here's what a heading style looks like, here's what these kinds of things look like. And, and rather than like getting pixel perfect mockups on every single page and what it's supposed to look like and then having to make that match and IE and stuff like that, instead what you do is you give them the idea of what the website's gonna look like and then it all comes together when the actual finished product is made. So you can get clients sign off on the smaller design pieces rather than like the whole entire thing. Um, and then a lot of people reference something called Pattern Lab, which is an example of creating like a uh, sort of like a style component guide. So you pick out what are the site colors of your 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 components, how are bulleted lists going to look, all this kind of stuff. So when people are designing the elements on the website, they just kind of copy and paste from this one type of thing. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I just wanted to point that out. Markup then versus now. So back then, these were the biggest techniques in uh, markup at the time. Non, well, actually, who can tell me what that is? Non-breaking non space, that's right. So that was when you needed a little bit of white space, but like, you know, you just like put 30 of those together and you were good to go. Uh, how about this, what's that? Oh, there's groaning, I know. This was called a spacer GIF. So you could have a transparent image that like spanned like 40 columns or whatever to give you just exactly the pixel perfect thing that you needed. Did a lot with frames. We did a lot with tags like center and things to give you alignment. There was a blink tag. Watch this. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then our good friend, who can never be, uh, hey, what's going on here? Oh, no. Oh, was it doing that? Oh, I don't see it here. Okay, awesome. So, yes, I should look at the right place. Yeah, there we go. Marquee. That was that was the the epitome of markup technique back then. So now we use this thing called HTML5, um, and HTML5 is kind of interesting because you know there was a movement for a while to do XHTML, which was like uber like anal like close all things and put the quotes everywhere and stuff like that. HTML5 actually almost in some ways gets us back to the HTML we were writing back then because it's actually more permissive. Uh, for the types of code that you write because their main goal is to make this stuff work across all browsers equally. So they have the browser vendors involved talking about like, what do you actually need to define a doc type? And they're like, I don't know, we just look for something that says doc type in it. They're like, perfect, so that's the spec. And so they've been doing a lot of this kind of work. And so what we get out of that is we get some new HTML tags to give us more semantic structure, so things like the header, nav, article, aside. This is all stuff you'll find out of the box in Drupal 8, and it's something that you can also download in, in base themes in Drupal 7. Um, HTML5 forms, this has also been added to Drupal 8. This is pretty cool, because you can say define, um, you know, an input type equals date, and then what it'll do is in a browser that supports that element, it will give you a different uh, input that is more date-like, and then it will fall back to just numbers if you don't have that capability. Um, so everything that they're doing in HTML5 is designed with backwards compatibility in mind, so you just get an enhanced experience if your browser supports it. And fortunately, I think all mobile browsers support it, or at least all modern mobile browsers support it. So this has been a big enabler in, you know, not making mobile browsers like have to click into other keyboards and stuff like that, trying to make it really fast. Um, so this is also in Drupal 8. Multimedia support, so back then you had like your object tag to pull in your Swift file and then you had to do embed because Netscape support embed and IE was object, I don't remember anymore because this is why I left this world. Anyway, now they have tags like video and audio and I think you still have to do that stuff as fallback but where things are going is building multimedia support directly into the HTML language itself which is pretty awesome. Um, HTML5 also has all this other stuff so you can actually do things like um, you know, graphic uh, manipulation in HTML5, geolocation, trying to figure out where people are and incorporating that into your web applications. Like, it's actually getting really, really cool. Um, and, 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 you know, like tying the web back together is, is pretty awesome. A couple of things that are in Drupal 8 that are, might be worth following on is one is called uh, Modernizer. What Modernizer lets you do is uh, do kind of like HTML5 feature detection. So you can say, hey, if this browser supports you know, RGBA colors, then do this, otherwise do that thing. Um, and it supports it in both CSS and JavaScript. And then for browsers that don't support HTML5, there's a shiv, also called a shim, which I was really confused about, but apparently the only difference is one has a V and one has an M. There you go, front end code. It hasn't gotten any saner. So, um, so what that does is that like backfills, or they call polyfill, um, the old HTML5 features into less capable browsers. 
Um, I also heard mention of this thing called HTML5 boilerplate. It's sort of a suite of things about frameworks. There's a lot of framework talk that we'll be doing in here. And what, what that thing does is basically get you started with like kind of just a basic, basic template that's got all the HTML5 stuff in it, a couple of external libraries to like modernizer to help you work better. Um, and it's just kind of a place to start rebuilding your web applications. If you are a front-end developer, you don't need crap like this, but people like me really need it because we have been out of it for a while and we don't know where to start. Let's talk about styling then and now. Uh, back then, we had 256 colors to work with. Uh, so we had this thing called, um, what's the D word? Oh, dithering. dithering, thank you, yes, dithering. So you had to like be very careful about using web safe colors and then you, there was this awesome graphics programs like Kai's Power Tools. You could like make page curls and stuff like, it was yes. epic, let me tell you. Um, and we wrote a lot of code like this where it was like body, background color, da 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 da, in every single HTML file because of course back then we did a page centric model. Um, and so we had the about page and the contact page and we'd have all this code everywhere. But if you ever wanted to change that, like say I don't want the background color to be black anymore, now I want it to be fuchsia, you had to do that in three different places times a billion or how many pages you had. So, um, and then we, for a while we used this thing called server side includes. Um, which is kind of similar, PHP and stuff evolved around this, but it was basically like, um, just include something called header.html that has all that stuff and then do that from every page. So it, it improved things a little bit. Um, but the real big you know, revolution was when CSS came out, right? Because then you could do stuff like just a styles.css where you put all of your colors and your background things and stuff, reference that from each file, um, and then you separate your presentation from your markup, which is a good thing to do. Now, there's CSS3, which is just an evolution off of CSS, and it has some cool things like um, new selectors and pseudo classes. So you can almost do like regular expression parsing, saying like I want links that start with this, and I want to make those blue. Um, you can do like styling disabled elements differently than enabled elements. There's a bunch of little things that have sort of evolved over time. Um, columns. Anybody remember having trying to do columns in CSS? We'll talk about this later, but yeah, it was pretty terrible. They're trying really hard to make that a lot easier in CSS3. Um, this thing called media queries, which we actually had back then. They were like print style sheets and stuff like that. But now it's sort of expanded to not only cover, um, you know, not only cover uh, printing versus screen, but within screen covering like, you know, what is the width of the screen? You know, is it in portrait or landscape orientation? These kinds of things. So um, a lot of that gets into some of the mobile stuff that we'll talk about. Um, you can now do things like uh, these cute little buttons just with CSS. So you no longer need like, you know, like these like corner graphics, GIF things and like trying to get all that to fit together in a table, like none of that. You can actually just apply a little bit of CSS and they can do a bunch of things like text shadows or border radius, linear gradient, all these kinds of things are just like, boink, code, done. It's pretty cool. Um, and the other thing that's kind of neat is you can do the, oh, sorry. You can do uh, CSS animations in uh, Go. There you go. Thank you. Um, and these different effects. So, like, you'll see, um, I'm using Keynote, which is like, oh, what a dinosaur you are. Because everybody uses whatever. There's like 18 of them. But yeah, you can actually do presentations with just HTML, JavaScript, and CSS now, um, and things like that. So, people are writing games, people are writing all kinds of stuff, and we don't really need to use Flash anymore because CSS has gotten so awesome. So let's talk about typography then and now. Back then, typography was great. It was so flexible because you could use any font that you wanted as long as it was one of these nine, right? <laughs> so Arial, Arial Black, Comic Sans, MS, whatever, these things. Because Microsoft put out what was called, I think, a web font pack or something, and it ran on both Mac and Windows, and so that was like, that's all you needed. Um, so that's why there was the, you know, that's why you see Comic Sans everywhere because that was the only non-serial font, I think. No, there might have been a couple other ones. So now you can actually use any font you want. There's this thing, there's a CSS3 property called at font face, um, and this allows you to pull in a web font and actually display it on the page. There's some licensing things there, so you can't like just put any old font in there. It's got to be something that's allowed, but there's a couple of tools to really help you with that. There's uh, Google Fonts, which lets you pull in uh, they have like a repository of, of open source web fonts you can pull in remotely. Um, or if you have a font that you own and license and blah, blah, all that. I'm not a lawyer, so whatever, but yeah. Um, but there's this thing called Font Squirrel where you can upload the font and it'll create a web font for you that you can use in this thing. So 
um, much more prettier fonts, so that's pretty cool. There's even more newfangled CSS stuff. Like, when I looked into all this stuff, it's like, it's crazy the amount of work that's been done on CSS. So uh, this is in Drupal 8, something called Normalize. It's a CSS uh, file that lets um, basically all the browsers start from the same starting point, you know. So you don't have some that give you a margin offset, some that don't give you a margin offset. It just puts everything the same. For a while, there was something called reset.css that did the same thing. But what reset.css did was, like, remove all of it, and normalize says, well, let's give you something that kind of makes sense and just make it the same across everything. So that seems to be where things are going. Um, newfangled term is a CSS preprocessor. Don't bother reading that text. I'll talk about what that is. So a CSS preprocessor is essentially a thing that you write your CSS code in in sort of a programming language, and then what it will do is it will compile out to CSS. Um, because CSS itself doesn't have very many fancy features. So there's Sass, and there's Less, and there's Stylus. Those are kind of the main three. Um, according to my Twitter stream, asterisk, uh, Sass is the most popular one that most people in the Drupal community seem to use. Um, but Less is also up there, and, and different frameworks use Less as well. But they all basically work the same, which is you can do things like variables. So instead of like every single style sheet rule having like pound zero 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 or whatever your font colors it, you define that once in like a dollar sign thingy, and then when it gets compiled, it will like put it out in the right order. So this allows you to define background color, foreground color, sidebar color, whatever, and then uh, you know write that out, and then have the CSS file just automatically put things in the right place, which is pretty awesome. Other things you can do are like imports. So if you have a nice reset.css that you like, you can pull that into whatever arbitrary SAS style sheets you want. Something called mix-ins, which is the dumbest word in the world. All it means is functions. So don't let those crazy front-end people like it. But basically what it is is it's a function that takes a parameter and you're able to change different things about it. So in this case, I can pass in a border radius of 10 or 20 or whatever and it will adjust all the different styles to do that. Um, and then there's also something in SAS particularly called um, extending and inheriting. Um, so you can say, rather than like redefining a bunch of stuff, you can say all of these classes inherit from a basic message class. There's just different types, errors and info and whatever. And it just saves you having to repeat a lot of code and having to update a lot of code when it's, when it's done. Uh, and then Compass is something that's sort of like a SAS framework. So it like pulls in a bunch of stuff, not only SAS stuff, and it just makes it easier um, to kind of set up and use and stuff like that. I heard a lot about Compass. I basically asked, I asked my Twitter followers, like, do you, what do you wish you knew about and what do you use that's awesome? And this came up a lot, SAS and Compass. So. All right, screen resolutions. Back then, it was pretty easy because everyone used one of these. So you basically had three sizes. At first it was only two, and then some fancy people got like big old monitors and you had to like, okay, fine. So you know, you do 1024 by 768. Now everybody has at least one of these. And this is your screen resolution like landscape, right? No. So <laughs> what do people do about that? Um, so back then what we did is there was like a choice between fixed layout and fluid layout. Uh, layout. And fixed would be like hard-coded pixel sizes, and then what would happen if you were on a big monitor is you just get more background. But the, it, you know, the stuff in the middle would stay the same size, regardless of how big the screen went. A fluid width was defined in pixels, and the way the pixels would expand and contract is like from uh, ratio size, it would always look the same, but then the difference in between the steps would be, you know, like it, it would get fatter, and then you'd all of a sudden be like reading text like this, you know, because they didn't really account for it. So it was kind of a mess. Now, it's still a mess, but there's basically two techniques that people use, um, and the, well, I should say kind of sequentially. So at first, people were using what's called adaptive design, and what adaptive design is sort of like fixed width per device. So what you do is on the server side, you detect what thing they're coming at the site with, and then if it's an iPad or whatever, you <laughs> have a completely controlled visual experience that you do for the iPad versus the you know, whatever, smartphone thing, Nexus things that people use, I don't know. Um, responsive is basically acknowledging the fact that I have no idea what you're doing and I couldn't possibly write CSS for every single device out there, so what I'm going to do is use those media queries that we talked about before to say, okay, if the screen gets wider than this width, 
then start laying out the columns like this. And if it gets skinnier than here, then start dropping the columns down to the bottom and stuff like this. And so when you see sites and you like take your browser window and you go whoop, 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 and then they like reflow the columns and stuff, that's responsive design. Um, and that's what Drupal 8 uh, ships with out of the box is um, the, the default theme, the admin theme, um, there's, there's features and views for creating responsive tables. All of that stuff is in Drupal core because that seems to be where the web is going, even though adaptive in theory is really nice. Um, and then like, don't ever get into this conversation with front end people because there, there's, they'll have this whole thing about like, is adaptive really that or is it a subset of response? Anyway, just don't, just use responsive design. That's, that's what my, yeah, anyway. Um, layouts, let's talk about layouts. So. Anybody ever do this, like accidentally nest a frame? Yes, right? Yes, that was great. So back then we had two techniques for layouts, tables and frames. Yep. That got everything that you needed to do. Now everyone uses CSS for this. Does anyone remember the site CSS Zen Garden? Yeah, it's a pretty cool site. Yeah, and CSS layouts, man, they were so simple. Because you know, you're just trying to get something like this, right? And you're like, Man, in the old days, I'd have to write this horrible code. God, it was awful. I'd have to write a table tag and a table row, and there'd be columns, just awful. With CSS, I can write awesome semantic code like this, right? And it's like left nav top. Oh, that's brilliant. Except that you have to write 500 effing lines of code like this <laughs> to make the friggin' thing work. Ugh. So this is what got me out of front end of it. Now, people use what are called grid systems, which is actually an old idea in, in graphic design, but they've adapted it to the web. <laughs> and so essentially what you do, and different frameworks work different ways. Uh, there's ones that do like, um, you know, put a special class on it to say it's a uh, column 12 or something like that. But you essentially tell the blocks, elements on your page, how many columns they should span and sometimes how many rows they should span and stuff like that. Um, it's actually a lot more organized and streamlined. Um, I heard a lot about singularity as a grid framework. I had heard of ones of like 960, but like everyone's like, nobody uses that crap anymore. So apparently singularity is a thing. What are other grid frameworks? Any front editors have suggestions? Zengrids. Zen Grids is good. Suzy, I've heard of that one. Okay. Okay, so, so Zengrids was like the first one, then Singularity is like Zengrids plus plus. Yeah. All right, is there anything that has like overcome Singularity as the, the awesome thing, or is that yeah, kind of the... Okay, so that's why I found that one. So yes, Singularity is currently the hotness. And then there's a lot of people who like said, now we don't just need a grid framework, and we don't just need a preprocessor and all this kind of stuff. Let's actually start making CSS frameworks so Bootstrap is one example, um, Foundation is another one, there's several of them. And again, if you're a hardcore front-end developer like a Morton, you will reject this stuff with the haughtiness of whatever. However, if you're like me and you couldn't possibly write a nicely designed thing to save your soul, they're actually really, really handy because they automatically have nicely formatted, padded, you know, like colors, stuff. So you don't have to think real hard about it, you just like pull in whatever you need to style stuff. So what you'll find is almost every open source project that you see on the internet today, their website is just bootstrap with like a logo in the corner. Because we don't know how to do this stuff and it's just download it, play with it, try it out, that kind of stuff. Um, mobile applications then versus now. That's actually a phone from the mid 90s. I found a picture, which is pretty epic. So back then, I don't know, Palm Pilots, there wasn't a lot, right? Um, and now, you, you know, there's a bunch of things that came out, but basically, um, you have iOS and Android. Those are pretty much the only ones. It's sort of like, back then there was Opera. What a scrappy little, you know, actually there were many things before Opera. But, um, but really only people cared about IE and Netscape, right? So it's the same type of deal, iOS and Android. And if you want to write an iOS app or an Android app, <clears throat> you get to ch choose between Objective-C which is all of the awesomeness of C, um, or Java, which will make you want to shoot yourself in the face. Um, so yeah, those are your options. Although, I will say, just yesterday, iOS released this thing called Swift. Swift. I haven't looked, I looked at it a little bit, but it's basically like Objective-C with a little bit less uh, syntax, but it's still C, you know what I mean? It's like. You need to be a, a, like a hardcore programmer kind of person, which makes me want to go like this because I took a Java course in school and I didn't like it and I don't want to go back there again. So 
The great thing is there's this thing called PhoneGap, or the open source uh, project behind it is called the Apache Cordova. And what it lets you do is write mobile apps in JavaScript, HTML, CSS, the stuff you already know, um, and just compile it out to, it's, it's like platform agnostic, you can compile it out to Android or iOS or whatever you want. Um, and that is pretty cool because, um, you know, this is kind of, things are going this way. There's kind of this interesting tension right now because, um, like, mobile, like, native mobile apps versus just writing HTML5 websites that look really good and everything. Um, and it's an interesting, like, counterbalance because for non-technical people, way easier for them to go to the app store and search for something and download a thing and then see a little icon for it. So even though... I would certainly love for everything to go to HTML5 and kind of open web standards. A lot of stuff is nevertheless still uh, heading in the uh, custom app direction. Scripting then versus now. I love this image. It's a huge frig off book like this thick called JavaScript and then there's like a tiny little book sitting on top of it called JavaScript, the good parts. That about sums up my feelings. All right, so here's some stuff. I'm gonna kind of fire hose some stuff, you know, but. Back then, we did this kind of raw DOM manipulation. Does anybody remember writing code like this? Well, it was friggin' awful. So you'd like, first of all, you'd have to check, all right, am I on IE or am I on Netscape? And then if I'm on IE, then they use, like, document.tags or document. I don't know. It was a whole friggin' pain in the butt. Now, to write this same blob of code that we have here, we use jQuery, and we do it like that. Hooray, right? <laughs> so jQuery is cool because it lets you eliminate all of that you know, horrible DOM parsing stuff and just tell it what you need, what property you want to need, and how to change it. The disadvantage of jQuery, though, is that it is a framework or an abstraction around JavaScript. So we're in this funny place where like, jQuery makes writing everything super easy so people use it a lot. But then uh, for a mobile application, or like a mobile device, you don't want to spend 400 hours like taking H1 and translating it down into whatever raw DOM manipulation would be. So there's actually this tension in the front end of community to go back to writing raw JavaScript over jQuery whenever you can. So there you go. So all the skills that you learned writing raw DOM manipulation code, they're still relevant today. And people will think you're a badass performant you know, front end developer if you use it. So. <laughs> We also had this thing called dynamic HTML, which was like this, I never really understood what the heck that was. It was like, uh, yeah, it was dynamic, it was whoosh, yeah. Anyway, so people use jQuery for that as well. There's like little jQuery UI thing that lets you download things. And then there's kind of like JavaScript has gone from this little toy language. Like I remember like alerting things, and I thought that was like the most, aha, look, at that's cool. And then I stopped using JavaScript because, you know, um, nowadays, JavaScript is sort of taking the world by storm. So what a lot of people are doing is using these um, what are called MVC JavaScript frameworks. Um, so they are throwing out all of the HTML that we in Drupal work so hard to write, all of it. They're like, I don't want to deal with your crap. And what they do is they use something like Drupal 8's REST API to just get JSON, raw JSON output of the data of the site, and they write their own custom markup around it. Um, so we include Backbone in core. We're using it for as sort of a way to, to centralize like the toolbar, in place editing, some of those like you know sort of front end features. But a lot of people are using things like Angular um, to just write completely custom front end apps and essentially just using Drupal as a as a as a data store. So it's sort of like what Dries was talking about in his keynote about headless Drupal. We already do that in Drupal 7 today, um, and people just throw out all of the code we work so hard on writing and just write their own stuff. There's also this whole class of what are called build tools. And I had four or six people try to explain this stuff to me. So here's my definition, and then people can yell at me about how wrong this is. My definition is it's kind of like, kind of, asterisk, kind of like drush make for front end stuff, okay? So it's like you say, I want to pull in this CSS and this JavaScript library and this and this and this and this, and you run a thing, and it will bloop, package it all up for you so you don't have to like manually get all that stuff together. Was that kind of accurate? Yes, I'm getting thumbs up, awesome. Um, and then I wanted to also talk about a couple of things that are coming soon. So there's like web components is this thing, um, which is, I, I don't know what a shadow DOM is, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> it's just like, I think, I think what it is is it's like a way to like write your own thing that is like taking over the page or I don't actually know. Um, and then also ECMAScript 6, which is like the precursor or the successor of JavaScript, whatever we use now. 
Um, anyway, and that has some new features as well. Um, yeah, so those are what I researched and what I found. And I'm curious to hear from people in the room, like, are there other things that you guys have come across recently that have either made your life awesome or, you know, like, remind you of horrible things that you used to do back then? Anyone? Otherwise, this is going to be a quick talk, <laughs> which I'm happy to let you all go early. Okay. So I covered every single awesome thing in front-end development? Yep. Yes! All right. <laughs> so everyone can go there. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, yeah, one, one thing that's different about uh, front-end development today is um, that SaaS stuff I was talking about, which is, you know, pretty cool and everything. Um, SAS requires you to run Ruby in order to do that comp compilation from the, uh, from the, you know, dollar sign thingies to the RIS thing. Yep, and Node.js to run the grunt. Node.js is interesting because that is JavaScript for both the server side and the front end code. So basically if you know PHP, you're the new COBOL programmers. Great, yeah. <laughs> I know, that hits too close to home, honestly. Yeah. Visual Basic, yes. You know, Visual Basic is all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the difference between SAS and LESS is that LESS does this all in JavaScript, so you don't need external tools for that kind of stuff. But SAS, you have to use uh, stuff. But it's interesting because a lot more front-end developers are familiar with these kind of command line tools like npm install and stuff like that. So we used to, in Drupal, think of front-end developers as like these poor, timid little people. We have to protect them from themselves. So let's add 30 wrapper divs and you know a bunch of classes so that they can figure it out. Um, and it's, it's really moving more into the direction where like front-end developers are becoming like developer developers um, and just in different languages and with different tool sets and stuff like that. So it would be interesting. Morton, did you want to talk a little bit about your, your, your theme uh, initiative for, for Markup? And then, and then I'll take some questions. Um, first of all, I'm wearing my American socks today to honor all of the American developers who have pissed my life off the last uh, seven years in Drupal. Um, now, the, one of the new things that now Angie has one of them figured out, oh, wait, front-end development is actually complicated. One of the things we have figured out is if you come into Drupal 7 today, you're going to go, what theme should I use? And then training people are going to yell at you and tell you what kind of theme you're going to use. And one of the reasons for that is that um, Drupal 7 built up a way of theming that was based on, hey, Thema, we are going to protect you from the code, and we're going to give you this, and you're going to have some class names and do it. And then a lot of us came in and rewrote the whole theme engine in all kinds of ways. So we ended up, instead of using our time together and building stuff, we built each of our own system. I'm, I'm one of them, and I'm today not proud of it. It's kind of dumb. So for the last two years, we have been busting hard to get Drupal 8, figuring out what Drupal 8 should do. We're changing the theme system, theme layer, and all that. Twig, you who, you who. Um, that does not solve the basic problem we have, and that is if we don't sit down as front-enders and actually figure out what it is that we want to do. So, so when next time Andy comes in, she only has to learn Ruby and Node.js and <laughs> figure out how Grunt works and setting all that up, and then she can build her theme. Um, there's a whole ton of stuff that, as you can see, now we're going to have in. We need to figure out how we get that into Drupal 8 from the get-go. So when you guys who's not comfortable about doing all this front-end stuff, we're not just going to drop you out in the middle of the water. Um, so doing this DrupalCon, um, we are going to figure out we're taking all the, 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 the what, theme leaders, whatever we call themselves, those of us who have been yelling too loud, and are going to sit down in the room and figure out, make a plan, make a strategy for it. Um, and we really need the input on it, finally. So if you meet me at some place, especially at the bar, and have opinions on this, or like, hey, this is the issue I stopped into. Because um, what we have been done differently in Drupal 8 is um, we got asked very early on what we wanted. That was how we ended up with Twig. Um, and if you want to know how all that Drupal 8 stuff is going to work, come to my session tomorrow at 4 o'clock, where we're running a, a two-hour talk about Drupal 8 and all the new fun stuff there is, and that's how many how many good things we have built in. So if you're nervous about how Drupal 8 works, from a front-end perspective, uh, you will not be that. If you're running a company that does Drupal front-end training, I'm sorry, we're going to make it so easy you don't have any classes to run. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the basic point. So that was just that plug-in. So we're actually trying to make a strategy now for the front-end, trying to figure out a way to make it work. 
So at least us frontenders are agreeing on it, and so we can move forward. So we're actually beginning to act a little bit like developers, and I'm not so happy about that, but it kind of needs to happen. So, so bottom line is, if you want to get involved in that initiative, come talk to Morton on Friday at the Sprint. So that is my talk. I apologize. I had like 95 slides, and I was like, there is no way I'm going to get through that in an hour. And I got through it in a half an hour. It helps if you talk really fast. So, <laughs> so uh, I saw a hand earlier. I think, yes. Oh, is there a micro? Oh, there's a microphone. Uh, just yell it, and I'll repeat it in the mic. I don't think that was a question, but it was a good statement. But yeah, so I think I'm going to try and repeat that, but it was very long. So the gist was that Jesus' talk, Jesus' keynote this morning, which if you haven't checked it out, you should check it out online, um, was um, it, it was very powerful and it painted this picture of um, where the web is going. And where the web is largely going is you have kind of like these, these companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook and whatever. Um, amalgamating all of this data and amalgamating all of these services that they can push together in order to get, uh, well, depending on your perspective, either really, really helpful or really, really creepy um, with your day-to-day -day life. So um, the question was, you know, as a, as a community of activists, which is what a lot of us in the Drupal community are, what can we do to fight that amalgamation and or at least, like, not get sucked up into it where we can create, like, our own Shadow Dom, ah, uh, ah. Uh, anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, and and sort of like create our own uh, space that sort of is like the anti that, where it still preserves the open web. Is that a fair summary? Um, yeah, it's tricky because I think you know he hit on some things that, um, you know, it, like and I worked with Dries on that keynote, and it was funny because he had this theory going into it that's like brands aren't going to like this. We'll get somebody to talk about how like oh it's horrible Google taking over kind of thing, and then found out that was not true. Like brands maybe necessarily don't love it, but they accept that hey it's the same as selling my phone into Best Buy or whatever that kind of a thing. So um, I think what we do uh, as web developers and like people who are also working on the future of the internet um, is I mean there's a number of different things. One is working on uh, privacy technology, so things like Tor, things like um, you know alternative to stuff like Twitter and, and some of these centralized services. Um, I think that's an area that we can be helpful with. I think we can be helpful with when when Dries talked about integration. It's like making Drupal better integrated with those things. Um, I think Drupal also has has its its power uh, traditionally as a community building tool. Um, and I think br making Drupal websites that can bring the people working against this thing together and make us function more um, as a team and as a group when we're, we're doing this kind of thing. I think we're in a world, though, where like, it's not like Google is going to go away. I think the best thing that we can do is create open and free alternatives to things like Google. Um, and you know, I get excited about, uh, I, I actually do get excited about Drupal providing this kind of technology in a free and open source way. Um, so that businesses can can use the power that Google has, but use it for good and use it for their own ends, like nonprofits being able to understand who's coming to their website and, you know, how to reach, how to connect them with someone who needs help in another country and and doing those kinds of things. So, I don't really know. It's interesting to see how it's all going to play out. I also think 
to Dries's point, and he talks about brands wanting to protect their brand, but I think it's it's really about identity. There's people, companies, nonprofit organizations, everybody who want to protect their identity, and they don't want to be sucked into these big, you know, big box stores of the web. Um, and I think everything that we do to make Drupal 8 easier to use, that we make it to, uh, you know, more power to non-developers, these kinds of things, I think those are all moves in the right direction to let people retain their freedom and participate in that world or not as much as they want to. Does that help? Hey, okay. Yes. So here's a question more along the lines of your slide. So during this research, after doing all this research and talking to all these people, do you feel more empowered or more enabled to work with front end again, or do you feel more specialized out at this point? So the, yeah, that's a good question. The question was, after doing all of this research, do I feel more empowered to work on the front end, or do I feel even more like, oh my god, there's all this stuff to learn? Was that basically the, yeah. Um, I would say I actually feel, I would, I, I'm, I'm always an optimist. I, uh, I feel uh, cautiously more empowered because what I found is like I had kind of worried that things had moved so far afield from what I knew that like I would just, I'd be like learning programming from hello world again. And what I found more was like all of the basics that we used in the 90s are still built on today. It's not like we use a different thing than CSS now or a different thing than JavaScript. We still use all the same stuff. It just is more better -er. And, and it's cool to see, like, the things that ca directly caused pain points back then have, have, like, people were like, yeah, that sucks, let's fix it. And it's actually embedded in language now a lot of time. Things like semantic tags for HTML, things like the font face stuff. Like, I know, like, there's got to be people in here, like, rolling their eyes and laughing, but it's like, I was, like, amazed. I was like, oh, that's great, you know, because I was so frustrated with trying to put a nice-looking website together back then. So um, I think it's a little... There's definitely more stuff to learn, but the stuff that there is to learn is more in my wheelhouse, you know. Things like build tools, things like, um, you know, some automated testing for JavaScript, things like that is all stuff I used on the PHP side. So it's more like finding JavaScript equivalents of what I already know. So in, in, when I put this talk together, I was actually feeling good because all this stuff sounded so opaque and scary to me that when I actually dug into it and looked at it, I was like, oh, that's just what we used to do plus dollar signs. Great. You know what I mean? Or whatever this kind of thing. So maybe that's because I didn't dig in enough to get scared enough, but that's sort of where I ended up. So, yeah. How about you? How do you feel about that? So I'll come from the other way, so coming as a front end developer. And honestly, my perspective is that I feel like the, the, the practices are splitting even further apart. Mm. That, that front end is becoming its own discrete. And that's kind of the point of my talk. Sorry, spoiler. <laughs> front end is So, so what David said is that, you know, there, he, kind of, he has a front-end developer, not as a back-end developer. He feels like the front-end community is, is moving further afield and that as they specialize in things, and you're talking about like the MVC framework stuff or just everything. Yeah, mostly, yeah, everything. Yeah, it, we're moving to a world where like where the front end code back in Drupal 5 and 6, it was like embedded in the CMS application that made a lot of sense. We're moving to a world where Drupal is sort of tangential to the front end development experience. And it's like, it's great that there's something out there providing me data. I am never going to use that thing. I'm going to build in my front end tools here. So it's almost like they're becoming further apart. So dang, well now I'm bummed. Does anybody have a good, like, you know, <laughs> anybody have a nice, like, happy question? We can, no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, it's true. And I think in, in some ways, like, when Dries was talking about things that make us more useful to Google or whatever, and that stuff like, you know, turning headless Drupal data repository stuff like this, uh, those also make us more useful to people like you who are like, I want to just use the latest, greatest front end cool stuff um, and letting Drupal just get out of the way and let you do that. And I don't. I don't know that there's anything wrong with that because, you know, Drupal's strength has always been, you know, as a, as a CMS that, you know, people could use without knowing how to code. So we've still got the little entity forms for them. And then for developers, it's always been about getting out of your way, letting you do whatever crazy thing you wanted to do and giving you the extension points for that. So I, I actually feel like if that's where front end is going, I would love Drupal to support that in any way we can. So. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, thanks, man. So Morton said he's giving me props. I was so nervous to give this talk. Like, I can't even explain. It was like, because I'm like, there's all these words. I found out if you Google any word, any word you can think of and put JS at the end of it, there's a goddamn framework for that. I swear to God. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, I, what I'm kind of interested to see is I feel like, I feel like doing this research in 2014 is kind of like doing CMS research in like 2002, 2003. Like, you know, so not when PHP Nuke was the only thing, but back when there was like, I don't know, movable type and there was like, you know, there was like, there was literally like, you know, and then there was like 87 forks of PHP Nukes. There was like, you know, post nuke and Zariah and, you know, nukey nuke, nuke, nuke. I don't know. But it was like all of these things and, and like a CMS selection process was huge. And then like nowadays, really in the open source world, it's basically WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla. You don't really hear about a lot of the other ones. You hear about them, but they're not like the big three. I feel like for most people, if they use something else than like Silver Stripe or, um, you know, one of these other things, it's, it's sort of justifying why not Drupal or WordPress instead of that. Front end frameworky things, as far as I can tell, are nowhere near consolidated. Like, there's a new front end framework spinning up every other week. People are trading best practices back and forth. So it's kind of an exciting time to see. And I'm really curious to, like, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm still not planning to get in front end development right now, but waiting another five years and seeing what it looks like then. Because then I wonder if by then there will be some consolidation in deciding that this thing is the thing to use and something else to be into. Jesse Beach, you're shaking your head. Never. Never. Okay. That's cool. You know, they always le learning new things and stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's been it's been interesting though because you know it it makes it very challenging as an outsider to understand what the landscape looks like because you know it's it's basically talking to a bunch of people and asking them what they use and then you know like you know, people you know are kind of clued into stuff. So um, it, it was funny because that's probably what it looks like for people coming outside to the back end community, it's like, what is all this crap about PHP unit and symphony and you know stuff? And I'm like, ah, it's cool. Anyway, yeah, so I, I thought that was that was a it was an interesting thing to research and yeah. Were you newbies in the room, did you learn something about how horrible web development was back then? Yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, are you gonna post your slides? Yeah, I'll post them on the session node so they'll be up later. And and also you should evaluate my session. That's what this slide says. Um, so when you evaluate my selection, you can hopefully download the slides later on this afternoon. Yes? You mentioned about um, Node.js making PHP, you know, like COBOL. Is there any kind of strategy or strategy with um, integrating Node.js with Drupal 8? Yeah, that was a good question. So uh, earlier I said it's kind of a combative thing where I said, like, if you're a PHP developer, it's the new COBOL because Node.js is JavaScript everywhere. Um, that, was, that was like... Um, not alliteration, what's the thing when you like, uh, hy hy hyperbole, yes, that was that, you know, it's not actually that bad. And the Node.js community is so incredibly fragmented that it's, it's really hard to find out what to use when, but I think it's interesting, because the idea, I mean, the idea goes back to like, .NET, right, or whatever, it was like, learn one, or Java as well, it's like learn one language and then you can write it everywhere, that kind of thing, it's, it's the same type of thing applied to front end code. But a lot of people are really excited about it, um, because, you know, it's new, it's cool, it does what you need, you don't have to learn, like, there's no mental separation between front end and back end, so the idea is really interesting. Um, Drupal actually already does integrate with Node.js in a lot of ways. What Node.js is really good for is um, things like, uh, say you're writing a chat room app, if you write that just in PHP, it's going to be really frustrating because every single time you post, you have to go back to the server and back and back to the server and back. Node.js, my understanding is it sort of creates this like queue of things that's just processed constantly. So you can like fire off things and let it process and come back to you. Um, so I know there's chat room apps that are using Node.js. There's, um, there's like a Node.js module that integrates with Node.js. So you can write the parts of your application that make sense to do in a, in a quick front end language like that, but then still use PHP for your data storage and other kinds of things like that. So it's, it's definitely worth checking out. It's, it, you know, and it's, it's, it's really popular in the front end world, particularly for kind of package management and stuff like that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually get threatened as a front end developer because the tooling is not quite there yet and the maturity is not quite there yet. But it's definitely something to look at if you haven't dealt with JavaScript since the only thing you can do is alert tags, if that makes sense. Well, actually, I, I, I use Node.js. Oh, you do use Node.js. Oh, so awesome. I was wondering yeah. How it integrates with 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's modules, and I'm not sure exactly what they're doing. If they're um, if they're pulling out like, well, we could look. I think I have internet. Uh, not that. It's funny though for um, for Drupal people who did not know Node JS was a thing. And they thought you were talking about modules slash node slash node JS, and they were like, "Why is everyone talking about this thing? It's kind of awful." But you know, like, and then it's like, "Oh, I get it. It's something else." But it was funny because I'm like, "Yeah, we had node JS like back in 2004. Like, we were all on top of that." Um, so this is the project. Oh, right, we changed this whole thing around. Ugh. Oh, there's an 8 version. That's fancy. I think Bejeebus is here, so we should just ask him about this kind of stuff. But um, hmm. So it looks like what it's doing is creating an endpoint for the Node.js to talk to Drupal and like send it JSON information that it would then parse out into stuff happening on the screen. That is my 8 second read of the readme.txt and my translation of what it does. But Say that again? They coexist well. They do coexist well, yeah. I mean, Drupal's, one of Drupal's biggest strengths is the ability to integrate with whatever. So like we have like MongoDB extensions, we have Node.js extensions, Oracle. I don't think it works, but you can do it if you really want to, like these kinds of things, so yeah. But no, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of developers in the community really excited about Node.js and they do, they do do integration work with it and maintain modules around and stuff, so don't worry about that. Any other things that I can help people with? Yes, sorry, I didn't see. I have see. two questions for you. Yeah. Um, and I apologize because one of them is actually sort of a statement with what do you think at the end of it. Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah, uh, so the, the real question, the one that's actually a question is, um, it seems like a lot of the things you talked about are ways in which front-end development is becoming more like a programming language, right, with variables and loops and all that. Um, did you get the sense that, did you get, it also seems like while it's developing those concepts, it's diverging from pretty standard like programming, like mixin instead of function and so on. Did you, did you get the sense that like the two were moving together? Like that there was like collaboration or like that front end people were sort of like cribbing from programming or that they were like inventing their own thing? Do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah, so his observation was like, you know, I talked about the fact that um, that it, it seems like uh, front-end development is moving more into world of like actual development, like things like, you know, SAS with, with variables and, and mix-in functions and things like that. And then the question was like, do we feel like, um, the front-end development and the developer-developer communities are moving more in line with each other or are they just kind of like inventing their own things separately? I don't feel like I have the context to answer that question. My gut feeling is it's kind of separate, that there's a lot of people, I, I see this a lot when I go to like Drupal Chicks meetups or whatever, there's a lot of people who consider themselves front-end developers or whatever, but not a real coder. And so I think, I think, I suspect that in a lot of cases, these are like, the the one the couple ones like the pattern lab thing that was a collaboration between a front end designer and a back end developer because the thing is actually like really crazy it like has like static HTML generation tools and all this other stuff um, but when you talk about SAS and mixins and stuff I like I just I don't know enough about that part of the history but you know I do feel like. I definitely don't feel like um, front-end developers feel like they're growing closer to developers. I feel like they're inventing their own thing that works for them, and, and but it's still being treated as separate. Even though when I look at the 10,000-foot view, it's like coming a lot more in line with like what I know, and I'm excited about that. But yeah, I don't I don't feel that. But I don't know, Jesse or Morton, do you have any insight on? That? Yeah. Oh, funny. <laughs> so 
So Morin said, like, from his perspective, he started out as a designer, which in the Drupal community can be misinterpreted to mean, like, database designer, because he did a buff around that, and three database guys showed up, which is interesting, or architectural design. Um, but a graphic designer is, is his background, and so he came from the graphic design world, wanted to make websites, and then just sort of had, was forced to teach himself these things, like coding and PHP and stuff like that. And I think, I think that rings true for a lot of people, which is one of the reasons Twig is so cool, which I didn't talk about, actually. Um, Twig is moving you away from having to be a PHP developer in order to change markup and stuff. So, like, if you look... At uh, no, yeah. Um, twi oh, you can't see this at all. Ah, you couldn't see the other thing I was doing either. Jeez, that's so <laughs> sorry. Here you go. Um, yeah. So. I'm sorry. So the thing I was showing on my screen, but not on anything you could see, was there's a there's a project slash Node.js, and that's that's where the integration code is. And then there's a bunch of modules that require it in order to pull in Node.js features. But anyway, this is Twig. Dries talked about this a little bit in his uh, keynote as well. Um, so in order to theme in Drupal 7 and below, asterisks except for Drupal 4.6, but that's a whole other thing. But anyway, um, you had to be a PHP programmer because all the template files were in PHP, so you had to go up the learning curve not only of like, how do I get my HTML to talk to this dynamic content generating thingy, but also how do I do it in this weird language with a lot of dollar signs and semicolons. Um, what Twig does is that it's an abstraction over that, so you still do the PHP in a module or in a theme preprocess function or something like that, but the actual template files are literally HTML plus a couple of these like special code formatting thingies, similar to Smarty or similar to Mustache or some of these other ones that you may have heard of. Um, and the reason why I'm excited for that is it helps the next Morton, who is coming from a graphic design, you know, I know how to make things in Dreamweaver type of deal, be a lot more proficient in, uh, in doing that kind of thing without having to go up all of the learning curves in the world. Um, so that's why Twig is kind of a big enabler. What we're hoping this can do is help bring in a lot more designers to the Drupal community because it, it eliminates that barrier. Um, and it also eliminates the problem, <clears throat> not that anyone has ever seen a site that does this, but you go in to like fix someone's performance on their uh, site and you find out their, their node.tpl.php has like 400 lines of SQL in it. Has anybody ever had that problem? Anyway. You can't do that anymore. Now you have to put that in a module or something where it belongs. So, um, so yeah. So that's that's Twig, and it's sort of trying to keep people in whatever path they want to be comfortable in. So if they want to make the jump to a developer, developer, that's totally fine. They can go into preprocess functions and start mucking around with things in there. But if all they want to do is add something so it's three pixels to the right, they can do it themselves. So that's kind of the gist. Um, but you didn't actually answer the question, which was, do you feel like um, you know, front-end developer and back-end developer are becoming more synonymous with one another, moving towards each other, or do you feel like they're in silos and not talking? I think they're way more talking now, uh, especially with the community that we have had uh, enough front-enders to step up and take responsibility for the project, and I think that has changed a lot of the way we look at each other. So it's not, we're not the uh, red-headed stepchild that comes in on the side. It's kind of, well, we know that if, if you're going to have to put us in Sorry, developers in the room. So Morton is saying, like, back when he joined the project, which was in, uh, or earlier in mid-2000s, 2006, it was like, the, the front-enders, what? You know, and so he got a bunch of people. I was actually at this meeting in D.C. where it was like, it was like, it was like a big coming out party. It was like this room, and there was like five, I don't know, 15, 16 people there, and they were like, oh, my God, you're a designer, and you work with Drupal? 
I'm a designer. I didn't think there was anyone else like me out there. And, and like, you know, oh, you know, like, anyway, it was really, it was really cool. So he was saying that he started an organization, organization being a, a collective, a group of angry people um, called Front End United. And what they have tried to do is sort of like make, uh, advocate on behalf of designers and get their concerns known in front of developers because we don't we, we oftentimes have blinders for that because we're like I don't know it's not fatal erroring it's good to go you know um, so that's that's kind of the thing so I'm just checking the time it is two o'clock and I want to make sure people have time to pee and all the things that you do in between sessions so thank you very much everybody appreciate it.